of the candidate has uh, selected to present. And I will start with Mr. Babinick. We're going in alphabetical order. I will ask you, Mr. Babinick, to go to the uh, lectern, please. And Mr. Babinick will be speaking uh, tonight about Congress and upstate economic development. Mr. Babinick, you have, you have two minutes. All right. We know that when it comes to jobs and the economic environment, things like taxes and regulation do make a difference. As if you have lower taxes and if you have less regulation, these things really do help businesses a lot. But at the same time, here in New York State, with our political environment, even though we have to fight hard for both lower taxes and less regulation, it's very difficult change to make at a state level and even at a federal level when you're only one of 435 congressmen. So while I'll continue that, I'll also say that my concentration when I think about jobs is to take advantage of our homegrown job creators, our people right here in this district, especially our next generation who want to work in the newer industries. Because I tell people all the time, if I had tried to start my company Trinet in upstate New York, with what I knew back in 1988, I would have failed. Now, by the way, California, New York City, Boston, tremendous job generating places, they have worse regulations and higher taxes than we have here. And yet, people flock from here to go to there to start companies. Why do they do that? They do it because it's easier for them to get connected to the right resources who can help them. For the last six years, I've concentrated all of my efforts with a nonprofit I started called Upstate Venture Connect that actually helps our entrepreneurs right here get going and get connected to resources even outside the local community. So when it comes to the Hamilton area, some of you are familiar with the Thought Into Action, which is a nonprofit started through Colgate that is an example of helping people here get connected with resources. And my nonprofit, Upstate Venture Connect, works with Thought Into Action to extend the reach of the Hamilton entrepreneurs with the opportunities far beyond this area. So this is leadership that I can bring to Congress that goes well and above policy. Mr. Babinick, the right part is time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Babinick. Uh, Ken Myers, you will have two minutes to make a response. <coughs> oh, you can respond. Uh, However, you want, want to the topic. You have a mic right there. I thought that we each gave our topic, but thank you very much. No, sorry we're, about that. We're going to be um, talking about this issue. For yes, I couldn't agree with Mr. Babinick more about regulations and how that stymies and hurts businesses and what we have to do in order to, to create and help businesses thrive is that we do have to look at what makes sense. We have to, uh, this is a federal position, so we have to look what is happening on a federal level that is in the way of businesses and, uh, you know, how are we going to accomplish that? What do we need to, for prim primarily in the 22nd? What's standing in our way in the 22nd? And we need to go to Washington. We need to, we can't do anything alone, and I agree with that. And that's where myself, I'm a legislator, I have always been one that looks at every single issue. Look at what the consequences are, look at what the what the intent was. If the, if the intent is not fulfilling what it was supposed to, you just don't keep doing the same thing over and over again. And it's also about building relationships. If you're going to go and be a lawmaker, or if you're going to represent your people, you need to be able to be someone with the temperament and the attitude that you're going to be able to work with people. And you're going to be able to look at all sides and come to a logical conclusion of what's going to be best for everyone. Not just you know one particular group or one another particular group. So I, I do agree that we have an awful lot of uh, regulations that are overburdensome to, to businesses, and we need to look at that. But we also need to look at what do we need to create jobs. And I know that here in um, the 22nd, as I've been going around to many, many places, we need to make sure that our, our young people and our people looking for jobs have the skill set for the jobs that we have, that they are we're producing the right individuals for um, advanced manufacturing for the jobs that are the future, not the jobs of the past. 
And I believe that we can do that in the 22nd very easily. Not easily. Okay. Ms. Tenney, you have two minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, as the person, the only person sitting here who owns a New York corporation, uh, both of my opponents have their, their companies, uh, one's incorporated in California, one's in Delaware, which is a well-known tax haven. And Mr. Babinick's own Upstate Venture Connect is actually incorporated in Delaware. It's supposed to be helping upstate New York businesses, another well-known tax haven. And you know, this is part of what's going on in, uh, in our country. The biggest problem I see when it comes to economic development is you have cronyism and you have uh, government picking winners and losers in a pay-to-play scheme. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that you see at the start of New York in New York State. On the federal level, you see uh, businesses getting advantages and, and tax breaks uh, so that they can unfairly, they're in the form of a subsidy, what corporate welfare subsidy, tax, uh, tax credits are actually a form of corporate welfare. I'm the only person sitting here who owns a business that doesn't have tax credits and corporate welfare in my business, which maybe explains why I'm still in New York and why I'm not worth between 50 and 150 million dollars like my, my two opponents. Um, I think it's great that they are, they're successful, but they've also gotten there by uh, taking advantage of the system, uh, by being very connected with politicians. Mr. Babinick says he isn't connected with any, any interest group, but the truth is he sat on one of the largest political action committees in the nation. He spent almost a million dollars lobbying to get tax breaks. He got 16 million in tax breaks for his company in 2014 and 15 alone. I mean, that's the kind of thing uh, that we need to fight against to protect our small business community, our family farms. Um, those are where the jobs are created. 70% of the new jobs in this nation are created by the small businesses. We need to empower them by reducing taxes, regulations, eliminating the cronyism, eliminating these pay-to-play schemes, and allowing them to thrive. And that will see, you'll see an instant growth in our area and in, in the stoppage of the migration. Thank you very much, Ms. Henny. Uh, now, Mr. Babnick, you will have two minutes to respond. Thank you. The fact is, I would like to comment. I normally don't uh, talking about things that are just not true. But since I got two minutes, I will have to point out when it comes to tax credits. Tax credits are offered to all businesses. If you're eligible, you take advantage of it. If you're running a company and you don't take advantage of a tax credit that you are eligible for and are offered to all businesses, you're probably making a bad decision. I wouldn't call that special deals. Um, and I'm also don't control any impact, so I don't know where that comes from. But let me concentrate on one thing I do agree with, and that is government should not be in the business of picking winners and losers. And here in New York State, we have done a tremendous disservice by taking our tax dollars and giving it to large corporations and then watching to see what happens when no jobs are produced. Start of New York being the greatest example of that most recently. But we also have a lot of pay to play where you see these special deals with uh, favored donors getting favored contracts and there is evidence of that all over. That's why my jobs plan is all about being focused on let's take advantage of our homegrown talent to help them get connected and so that they can start their companies here instead of moving away to have them start someplace else because we're not lacking in smart people. The studies would show that in areas like I've mentioned, San Francisco, Boston, New <coughs> York City, these areas that many of these companies start up, they include many people from upstate New York, people that had their opportunities to grow up here, get educated here, and want someplace else to do it. We can make a difference in having them do that here, start companies here, keep our families together, but it means creating the right environment so that this is a place. Mr. Babinek, your time is up. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Myers, you will have up to one minute to respond to what's been said. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I agree with Mr. Babinek. There are some things you just, you can keep saying them over and over again, but that doesn't make them true. Economic development does not mean tax-free. Creating jobs does not mean you get away with things. As an owner of a small business for 15 years, I know what it's like to be a small business owner. I know what it's like to be a family member that grows a large business. And when you receive, um, oh, say for example, 
you buy a piece of property and you build a building on it for $100 million and you're going to employ 500 people and the tax revenue on that property was zero and the tax revenue that will be on that, that building will be up to $15 million. I don't think that's a giveaway myself, but uh, I do agree that there needs to be accountability. There can't be information that you're going to create a job and then you don't, and then you, you, you don't produce it. I agree that when you do have a uh, business come in, there must be accountability. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Ms. Tiny, you now have a minute to respond. Yes, I just say uh, go to uh, LexisNexis data search shows all this happening. Now, Mr. Badmack is on the board. He has numerous judgments across the nation uh, for failing to actually comply with the tax credits that he was given. These are public record, uh, his, uh, the, the public record of the, the million, nearly a million spent lobbying. I mean, the, the point is, uh, we need to have a system that businesses can thrive and can succeed without having to curry favor with politicians and rely on that. And that, that's, that's all I'm saying on that. You know, we're still here in New York. We haven't sought another tax haven. We pay our taxes right here. Um, and I think that we need to understand that our family farms can't just move out of New York State. They need to have the protection without having to get corporatism or handouts and things like that. And a tax credit is cash, cash in the pocket of whomever gets the tax credit. And when you're profitable, um, you get the cash back. When you're not profitable because you're not getting money from uh, politicians, you're not getting a credit. You time is up. Thank you, Ms. Tenney. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Babinick, do you have a minute to respond to what uh, has been discussed? What I can say is I really welcome people to actually look at public records and sort this out. Without my word, I think if anyone that takes the time to look at it, you'll see there's no there there. But I would point out that politicians that take contributions from special interest PAC funds as their fuel to get elected to office end up having to serve the masters of who they're taking the dollars from. And this is a problem that's endemic, not just for the candidates that are running for this office, but throughout our entire system. And as a result, we end up having too many politicians that are beholden to too many other interests other than the voters. I'm the unpolitician that will be beholden only to you, the voters, and will do my best to bring about both electoral reform and campaign finance reform. Thank you very much, Mr. Babinet. We'll now move on to uh, the second question. This will be addressed by Ken Myers. I'd like to ask you to go to the lectern, please. And the question that uh, Ms. Myers will be addressing uh, will be Congress and Sustainable Upstate Agriculture. And you'll have two minutes. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Does this have to be? Can you hear me? Uh, I picked agriculture because I understand that agriculture is a huge part of the 22nd District. And I believe that our family farms and farming it's not only important to us, it's part of our culture. And we need to preserve that culture, and we need to make sure that our farms and our agriculture is profitable. The dairy uh, industry is, we need to modernize the dairy pricing structure so it makes sense for our farmers and for our consumers. We need to protect the dairy safety net milk income contract set by, the, uh, there's a floor and then there's for milk prices. We need to make sure that that makes sense. And I've been to a couple of dairy farms and I was just sickened when I was talking to this farmer and he said, oftentimes he has to dump his milk because of uh, the prices. And that, that seems very, that just seems terrible to me when I know we have school children that could really use that milk and that that would be beneficial to them. I'm endorsed by Senator Gillibrand, who has a great, she's been a champion of farmers, and I will work diligently in Congress with her to make sure that we can, can move this agenda and help our farmers. But I'd like to also talk about what we can do here in the 22nd that would be profitable and would help our farmers. We can help them with a couple of different crop, the crops that they could grow. One would be hops. Hops is usually imported, imported from across the country, and it's one of the fastest growing things is craft breweries for entrepreneurs. 
we can get, I've talked to crop, um, hop farmers, and uh, they're, they're eager to do that. I'm not going to get to everything I have to say, so I'm really sorry. I'm going to try to wrap this up. But the most important thing that we can do to help all agriculture from a federal level is we can lift the ban on industrial hemp. That is a cash crop that has all kinds of properties and all kinds of products from, and you can't even list all of them. It, it yields paper, for example, one acre of hemp would take two acres of trees to produce. So you're uh, going to tie this up, Ms. Myers. Thank you. Thank I'd you love to tell you more about it if you're interested. Uh, Ms. Tenney, you have uh, two minutes to respond. Uh, the, the problem with, uh, sorry, <laughs> agriculture and uh, being the number one industry in the state of New York is that uh, we continue to put forth uh, many barriers to the ability, the cost of living. Um, this year, a three-tiered minimum wage was forced uh, on the state level, which is, did not have a special carve-out or a significant carve-out for farmers, which is going to be very difficult for them in employing people that they need to do the work. Uh, the federal milk order is uh, very complicated, and it's uh, really just the, the federal government intruding and creating, uh, determining the price of milk every two weeks instead of the market. So farmers have no control over what they're going to be receiving for the price of their milk, and so much of that depends on the region you're from or how it's selling. Uh, you know, it's a commodity. So uh, you know, one of the biggest problems is that uh, you know one of the other issues that has been forced. Uh, actually, Senator Gillibrand is the champion of this: is to force. Um, unionized labor on, on farmers, and uh, many of them are very much against that. That would be a disaster for our farm community. It would be the end, the finish, complete of, of the tradition of family farms in, in our upstate communities. Uh, there's no carve out in that. Um, there's a bill presented in the state assembly, and, and quite honestly, um, I don't think that's uh, Senator Jill Brand's endorsement is going to be anything that any farmer is going to be excited to hear about when it comes to promoting and pushing something like that without a carve out for farmers. Um, you know, another uh, aspect of farming that could help, I mean, many of uh, the farmers, especially the seasonal far uh, work, seasonal uh, farmers use migrant workers and uh, creating a better program for uh, allowing them to use the migrant workers legally, which they do, uh, would also be uh, helpful. But that's, I'm out of town. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tenney. Uh, Mr. Babinick, you have two, uh, two minutes to respond. Local farmers are so important, especially for our smaller rural communities. And throughout District 22, this is critical. And Hamilton would be an example of such a community. What, we're surrounded by farmers, and it is an important business in this district. Uh, it, I am absolutely um, in agreement that regulatory-wise, we have some issues, uh, including not only the minimum wage side, but also the immigration side. Immigration for we talk with local farmers, especially those that are running small farms and trying to um, scale up to become a mid-sized farm. Access to the H-2A program so they can have guest workers come from other countries for the season is a big problem. I also have talked with many farmers that complain about the federal government's overreach through executive order on defining what is a navigable water. And believe it or not, something that specific ends up restricting how the local farmer can use their land and it, it creates problems for them to uh, not do what they want to do as a result of that regulation. And finally, I would point out that subsidies is another area where um, big corporate businesses that are running some of the largest farms in this country have coated the playing field to receive favored treatment for subsidies, including for commodities like corn and sugar that don't make a lot of sense in terms of the overall market, but because they've had the political power, they've been able to muscle it through. So one of the things that I'm committed to will be to help roll back some of these subsidies that don't really work to the best interests of the consumers, as I'm more interested in helping the local farmers, specifically the small to mid-sized farms that are so vital to our rural communities. All of this you can find on my agriculture issues paper on the Batman for Congress website. Thank you, Mr. Babinick. Uh, now I will ask, uh, let's see, Ms. Uh, Ms. Myers, if you will uh, respond two minutes. Yes, thank you. And um, pardon me for being overexcited about agriculture and not being able to, in two minutes, uh, 
express it all to you, but uh, I think that agriculture in our area is an area that has a potential for great growth. And yes, there we need regulations to be lifted, and the, the migrant farm workers it is an absolute area because that only qualifies seasonal, and we need our farmers sometimes need year round. But we also need to make sure that simultaneously we're helping the overhead of our farmers. You know, for example, their energy costs. And we can do that by creating um, sustainable energy. I've been here in Madison before and witnessed the, the wind farms that, uh, and the turbines that are producing for some farms very inexpensive energy that will help them be more profitable. And they, it doesn't cost them anything. There's companies that can do that and they can put the electricity on the grid, and that's a big help to them. So I think that, yes, uh, we, we have regulations on the federal government, but we also have other areas that we can look at where they're struggling, for example, in um, providing energy to, to run their farm. They also, when we talk about, and maybe this is a bad word, but uh, tax credits, when there's in the federal government, sometimes you can get tax credits for certain things for our farmers to be able to upgrade their equipment, to be able to improve their farms, to be able to yield more uh, goods with their farm. And I don't think that's a bad thing for our farmers. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Babinick, you may speak for one minute. We have, within this area of farming, uh, the number one industry in New York State now, believe it or not. So this is an area that we want to give the attention it deserves for both a regulatory front and also a leadership front. Part of what a congressman's role is is to provide good constituent service in helping whoever the constituents are, whatever business they're in or people that are trying to navigate through um, federal issues and regulations, even as individuals, the right service. And uh, this is an area that, as a business person, I have a lot of experience in and would say that you want to have a congressman that understands how to deploy the resources to help the constituents, in this case farmers, get the most out of the federal resources that are available to help them grow. And specifically, my interest is pointed towards that small to mid-sized farm. Thank you, Mr. Babinick. Ms. Tenney, you have a minute to respond. Uh, Again, on the farms, sure, I, one of the things I didn't get to on it is uh, not only the migrant worker, um, it, there is possible, one thing the dairy farmers actually struggle from is that there is no year-round program where dairy farmers can access uh, migrant workers. It's only a seasonal uh, option. So uh, in that way, that could be helpful to, to dairy farmers. But right now, um, dairy farmers, again, are, are suffering the most is because of the milk order pricing. And that's something that we need to change in Congress. Although. The latest farm bill, uh, you know, it's, it's questionable whether it was really helpful. It really was more helpful to the larger farms than the smaller farms. And it's been proven with studies that actually the safety of the animals, the quality of the um, products produced is actually enhanced and greater in a smaller farm setting than it is in some of these big mass industrial farms. So uh, I think obviously it's a big issue. Um, my family background, um, my grandparents and, uh, and my cousins and my brother's family are all in the farming business, whether it's dairy, uh, beef cattle, or Your uh, time is up. in um, crops. So, Thank you very much, Ms. Denny. Uh, Ms. Myers, you now have one minute to make a final response. Um, I think the good news here today is that all of the candidates are in agreement that our family farms are very important. We need to support them, and we need to do whatever we can to help them grow. I, again, have a very positive attitude with the ability to lift the federal ban on hemp and have our farmers be able to grow a cash crop that ha will also bring jobs to the area because of the byproducts from that hemp can okay, have processing and, and manufacturing all of those goods near the, the growth. It requires 50% less water than, than other crops, no pesticides, no herbicides, very little fertilizer. This is a good thing for our farmers, and I know that we have some um, uh, research being able to grow it here in Morrisville and in Cornell, and so on. it's under very strict um, guidelines. And so I'm hoping that that will yield, and the federal government will be able to come to the conclusion that this is no longer a threat, that this is a good thing, and it's the oldest. Your time um, is up, Ms. Myers. 
domestic problem in the United States. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I won't penalize you for being a millisecond over. Uh, next, we will have uh, Claudia Teddy address the audience on the topic she has chosen, which will be Congress and National Education Policy. And uh, Ms. Teddy, you have up to two minutes to present. Uh, thank you. Uh, obviously, as a member of the State Assembly, education is one of the number one issues uh, that we handle. It's probably the largest part of the budget other than our Medicaid budget and uh, that we handle New York State. Uh, I'm on the Education Committee in the State Assembly, so I've been uh, at the front lines firsthand fighting some of the issues with No Child Left Behind, which brought us Common Core, and now with ESSA, which is actually not totally solving the problems a little better than No Child Left Behind. Uh, but one of the biggest problems I have with our national education policy is that really the federal government should be dictating to our local school districts, our parents, and our taxpayers locally how to educate their children. That's our task. Uh, it's the state task, and it's also up to our local government since we take money from our taxpayers via the school tax, which is the most onerous tax many of us pay if we're property owners. Uh, so. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I've always, um, I've been against Common Core from the very beginning, not because I don't think we should have standards, of course we do. I grew up in a, in a public school where we had testing, and testing is good. Testing is a tool for teachers to judge students, not a tool for bureaucrats and administrators in Albany and Washington to determine whether or not your students are succeeding and to take, uh, you know, judge teachers that way. Um, one of the things about Common Core, though I say I like standards, I mean, I just think, you know, the concept of a national bureaucracy uh, dealing with this issue is kind of like, uh, you know, an anathema to what our Constitution stands for. We revere uh, individual rights and freedom. So each child is different. We're not producing hamburgers, you know, that have to be identical in New Jersey as they are in Tennessee and as they are in New York. We have children that are being taught by professionals who we put high standards on. And it's something that I think we really need to be sensitive to on the federal level to make sure we're not intervening and dangling cash over our state uh, and our local governments uh, and leaving them destitute with, uh, with various uh, mandates that are coming from the federal government. So I will hopefully get a chance to come back on this in the next round. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tenney. Uh, Ms. Myers, you have two minutes to respond. Thank you. As I had stated, uh, education, in my mind, is the key to everything. And the fact of the matter is, the Common Core is not the problem. The Common Core was not, is not a federally mandated program. As a matter of fact, the Common Core was started by the governors of each state and their education chiefs who said that our students are not ready for college, they're not ready for work, and we need a common set of standards. Third grade in every classroom should have the same skill set across the country. We're also a uh, society that's moving around the country. If you leave, have, take a job someplace else, your child should not be behind or ahead. Common Core is not the problem. The Regents Reform Agenda is, is the problem. And the, the um, Every Student Succeeds Act is helping with that. It does allow the more local control, which it should be. There should not be a common lesson plan for third grade across the entire United States. That doesn't work. Our teachers, individual teachers, know best how to get that skill set. But the skill set to be common in the United States so that everyone in 